Thank you for listening to this teaching from Casa View Baptist Church, located in Garland, Texas. Our mission is to love God, build relationships, and change the world. To learn more, visit casaviewbaptist.org. My name is Gerald Schroeder. I have, I have a, thank God, a strong science background from MIT, Master's Institute of Technology, Bachelor's, Master's, PhD, seven years in the physics staff, seen a whole range of atomic bombs detonated, moved to Israel, met my wife, Barbara Sofer, a great writer, and uh, then uh, teach Torah and science. So luckily, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky that I have the two that come together. And one of the questions is a, that I'm asked as a scientist is how can a scientist really believe that there's something that we refer to usually as God? You know, is this metaphysical whatever acting in the world or producing the world? And the irony is the question's really a non-starter. Science has in fact discovered God. And you can talk to the hardline atheists and they will say, it looks like science has indeed discovered God. And how would that be? Well, if you take the trouble of going to the web and, and they're typing WMAP, the initials for, for a satellite, it's a diagram that shows the development of the universe from the creation over time. It's a timeline. Every word on that diagram comes from the NASA site. It is the condensed knowledge of the scientific community of how the universe created and how it got to where we are today. Each of the lines, the vertical lines, is another billion years. Okay, you start from a burst of energy at the extreme left side of the diagram, and you end up at the far end with the oval. The oval sh is to indicate expansion in all directions. Of course, because it's a timeline, we can't show that on, on a single piece of paper. We see here, most amazingly, that on the extreme left edge, it shows a beginning to the universe. Now, go back less than 50 years. If I were teaching that at Tech, I might have, you know, a person could lose tenure saying that there was a creation of the universe. It sounds like it's Bible. Because less than 50 years ago, the overwhelming scientific opinion was the universe is eternal. There was never a beginning. The Bible is wrong from the very first sentence. And then we discovered, suddenly, Arno Penzies and Robert Wilson, the Bell Labs in New Jersey, the northeast of the US, discovered the echo of the Big Bang, the energy left over, which George Gamow, 60 years ago, predicted that if there had been a universe created hot and small, it would have exploded, and the energy would get more and more dilute. And, the, and Penzias and Wilson, these Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson, discover this energy that had been predicted overnight. The Bible got it right. There was a beginning to the universe. Now, the black in the diagram is nothing. It's not a vacuum. Vacuums are within that diagram, within that cone of expansion. Vac vacuums are empty space, and space is something. The black of the paper around the diagram is nothing. It doesn't fit in our human brain, because humans think in a box, a box made of time, space, and matter slash energy. No human, as clever as they might be, as expansive as they might be, thinks out of that box. So when we say outside that diagram is nothing, we can use the words, but we can't conceive of nothing. It doesn't fit in the human brain. How are we going to have this idea, is there a God or not? Notice that the creation force isn't a three-letter word, G-O-D. If you look at the words carefully, it's a quantum fluctuations. That understanding was first brought down by Ed Tryon, brilliant human being, in the journal Nature, almost 40, 50 year, 40 years ago. The universe allows creation of something from nothing, provided you have the laws of nature, the quantum fluctuation. Tryon realized, and he published in the journal Nature, one of the two leading peer-reviewed journals in the world, that you can create something from absolute nothing, provided you've got the laws of nature, quantum physics and the laws of relativity, in other words, the laws of nature. So look what science has discovered. We can create the universe from absolute nothing, provided we have the, the, the forces of nature. Now, the laws of nature, the forces of nature aren't physical. They act on the physical. So if they create the universe, that means they predate the universe. So now we have a set of forces, we call them the laws of nature, that are not physical, that are able to act on the physical. They create the physical from absolute nothing. And they predate the universe, which means they predate our understanding of time. Put that together, it sounds very familiar. If you haven't noticed it, that's the biblical definition of God. There's only one nuance that's left, left, 
left hanging, we can talk about it another time perhaps, is that which created the universe, those forces active in the universe. But up to that point, science says, we, you are correct, the, the definition of the biblical God is predates time, outside of time, God is not a physical being, is, is a force, and it creates the universe. You'll notice that the opening chapter of Genesis, the only name for God is Elohim, God as manifest in the universe. Science has indeed discovered the biblical God. Well, we just need one part left, crucial, that which created the universe is also active in the universe itself. The very fact that you're watching this now pretty much establishes that point. Um, you can uh, find out where you can get the video. I, I had to listen to it three or four times and get out my dictionary. Uh, I Just be honest with you, MIT PhD physicists are like, like that over my head. But, but what I wanted you to see that was so important to me is, is here you have a secular physicist. And uh, although I don't agree with his timeline, NASA's timeline, and, and you have secular th scientists saying that before anything created, there were rules and laws, there had to have been a God. In other words, there was something that existed before this existed. And that's important for us to understand because you and I, our, our, our grandchildren, our children are growing up in a culture where the majority of people believe that there is not a God. Matter of fact, so many of them, I will tell you today, that, that there, 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 are no, there are no absolutes. That, that, that we, we determine what is right, we determine what is direction, there's no absolutes. And when I talk to somebody that says there are no absolutes, I ask them this question, you ready? Now, do you absolutely believe that? And I get, I, almost every time, well, of course, I, I absolutely believe that. I said, therefore, you believe in absolutes. You absolutely believe there's no absolutes. Therefore, even the sentence itself says that, that, that you're, you're contradicting yourself. You see, the truth about it is there are either one or two options on absolute truth. Either man is his own absolute truth or God is the absolute truth and authority. Now, here you have a secular scientist this is when you look at everything that secular scientists believe about creation, there is only one way to resolve it, and that is there has to be a God. So this absolute empirical scientific truth that they look at defines that there has to be a God that placed absolutes in place. Now, I told you there's three theories we're going to deal with that I'll never have enough faith to believe in. Number one, that everything started from a big bang. I'm sorry, but, but the odds of that are just like, whoo, astronomical. Uh, that means every single one of us won the Powerball yesterday or however many billions it was. I don't know. And uh, the second one is that you and I evolved from a single cell. You know, uh, rat, cat, boy, you know, all same, just, you know. We're all cousins, and uh, I, I just, I, sorry, I, I, can't, I can't fathom that. The, the, the third thing I can't fathom is that man can be good without God. You see, I, I just don't get it. Part, part of the reason why I don't get it is that, is that I don't know, I, I don't like me. I'm, I'm at, a, at a church conference and, you know, they're talking, you know, all these pastors there and this lady came up to me and said, you don't dress like a preacher. And I said, no, ma'am, I don't. She said, you, you don't even look like one. And I said, no, ma'am, I'm trying really hard. She said, uh, well, don't you like preachers? I said, man, I can't stand them. She said, well, aren't you one? And I said, there you go. I mean, think about it. Think about each and every one of us sitting here. How many of you can say that I am totally pleased with everything I've ever done in my life? From, from the time I came out of my mother until today, I would not go back and change a single thing because I am absolutely everything I ever dreamed I would be. Come on. Who in here has not been on a diet that didn't work? 
How many of us that have gotten older have said, well, you know, I used to look like that. You know, I used to be able to do that. What I want to do is I, I want to share with you, I want to share with you a few reasons why I believe that we can teach our children, our grandchildren, why we need God in order to be good and to come to a place where we go, yep, I am amazingly, absolutely pleased with where I am. See, I believe you can get there. In the book of John chapter 17, Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and he prayed, Father, the time hours come, glorify your son that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those that you have given him. Now remember we talked about last week how Darwin said the reason why he wrote his book is that, is that he, could not, he could not accept a world in which there was a God who had authority over his life. Darwin's words, not mine. You see, Jesus, Jesus said, God, here, here's, the, here's the thing. That, that I want them to have eternal life and I, I want them to know me and to understand me. Notice he goes on to say, I have brought you glory on the earth by finishing the work you gave me. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you from the beginning of the world. Notice that Jesus agreed with this MIT physicist that God before the world even began, even before the world began, God, you and I were present. He goes on in verse 24 and says, Father, I want those that have given me, that, that you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. You see, one of the things that you and I need to understand, when God created everything that exists and he created science and physics and, and all the principles, you know, the truth about it is, created the idea of gravity even. There's some more things that God created. He created you and I. Why? Because he loved you. It's the reason why he did it. Do, do you understand that? Do you understand that when David said that, that I am beautifully and wonderfully and uniquely created by God, that he was talking about you? Jesus said, Dad, I'm going to the cross so that they can know how much you love them. God's love for you is not based on your waist size or how much hair you have now or how much hair you used to have. It's not based on how well you perform. It's based on the fact that you are his child. So when you and I talk about God's standard, God's standard is not about putting you in your place. It's not about I'm going to do something to make you to, to, to make you hurt. I'm going to do something because I want to take something from you because I want to see you suffer. It has nothing to do with that. God's standard, God's law, and God's love is designed so that you and I could live life and have it to the full. You see, without God, there is no standard. Man becomes his own standard. In the book of Exodus chapter 18, uh, Jethro is Moses' son-in-law. Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt and they're going through the desert and, and people are having disputes and they're coming to Moses and saying, Moses, you need to get my brother or my sister or my family or, or they stole, this guy stole my chicken. <laughs> Listen now to me and I will give you some advice. This is Jethro to Moses. And may God be with you. You must be the rep people's representative before God and bring their disputes to them. Teach them his decrees, instructions, and show them the way they're to live and how they're behaved. To select, but select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who, are, who a dishonest gain and appoint them as officials over thousands and hundreds and fifties and tens. Have them service 
as judges. You know, one of the things that you and I need to understand is that Jethro looks at Moses and says, Moses, listen, you're not to be the arbiter of people's issues. You're to point people to God. Now, I want you to think about just that, that just a moment. How has that affected you and I today? How has it affected us that Jethro says, Moses, your job is to point people to God and to God's laws and allow God's laws to the direct them. The, their, your opinion doesn't count, Moses. Has that ever affected your life? How about this one? In grade school, did you learn these words? We hold these truths self-evident that all men are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, such as the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. Even the framers of our nation understood that there are certain things that God has put in place for people's blessing, and we should abide by them. You see, the truth is that man without God is self-focused. It's all about what I want, what I need. I, I you know, I, 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 I prayed for Toby Keith's family. I'm sorry Toby Keith's gone. And uh, it's a nice, nice, nice Oki from Oklahoma, good guy. But one of his songs was like the, the, the worst song in the world. And it's, and the title is, it is What About Me? What about me? What about me? What about me? What I want, what I think, what I like, what I want, what I need. It's all about me. Do we not live in that world? We, we live in this me world, that, that me-centric, that what I want and what's best for me, what I deem is best for me, that's what I want. That is, that what, that is what makes things right. You live in that world today. Two years ago, the state of Oregon passed a law stating that it was no longer illegal to uh, partake of drugs in public places. And, and drugs were any type of drugs. So uh, if you want to like shoot crack on the sidewalk, go to Oregon, it's your place. Heroin, fine, it's your place. Uh, you want to take fentanyl, you want to take you know, just go, you know, go there. For, forget marijuana, hit the hard stuff in public, it's quite okay. So the world's headed, headed Oregon, right? Oregon passed the law this week. Matter of fact, the reason was is that people should be the arbiter of what they want and what they believe is right. The governor of Oregon stated that publicly. This week, the, the governor of Oregon stated, I am going to sign the law that makes it no longer legal to partake of illegal drugs in public places. And her reason was, is that in the county in which she lives, the death rate because of overdoses in the last two years while the law has been in place is only up 533%. Now, now, it's put in place because I have the right to decide to do whatever I want to do. Because if I think it's right, then it has to be right for me. The only problem is that when people decide what's right outside of the laws of God, what's right becomes a free-for-all. The book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 and 3, Therefore, as your brothers urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment and according with the faith of God that is distributed to each one of us. Paul is saying, here's what you need to do. Instead of living like the world and saying, you know what? I am the arbiter of what's right. Maybe it's possible that the God that created everything exists, created a way for things to function, and I need to fall in line with that way that it functions because when I do that, it will be a blessing. 
You see, the truth is without God, man doesn't have the ability to, to accept himself. Uh, there's a philosopher, a uh, uh, psychologist, Maslow, who put together uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that every human being has needs. You know, your base needs, you need food, you need a place, you need shelter. You need food in your shelter, then you need clothes, and then you need the right kind of clothes, and then you need better food, and then you need an education. At the very top of it, you need an enjoyment, and self-actualization is at the top. Everybody should be shooting for this place where you come and say, oh, I love me. <clears throat> Maslow in his book said this, self-actualization rarely happens, certainly, certainly in less than 1% of, of the adult population. The guy that wrote the book on going, wow, I can be good for me, says less than one of you to make it, so all the rest of you forget it. You're never going to get there. You have no hope of accepting yourself, accepting life, of even being happy. I, so I thought, well, what are they teaching people? How do, you get, how do you get this, I'm happy with me? How, you know, you know, how, how do you get that way? You ready? I was reading one lady who's a professor at a leading, <coughs> a leading college. <coughs> and she said, ultimately in life, we need to make sure that we do multiple things to enjoy ourselves and bring ecstasy and the ultimate reality of life will be filled with joy and laughter, peace and prosperity. That you need to make sure that you do it quite often, multiple times during the week, or else you cannot obtain that high state of self-acceptance. Wow, that just wears me out thinking. I've got to do something exciting and, and fun and stimulating every single day so I can say, wow, look at me. I just thought I'd let you know something. You're never going to get there. And if you do get there, you can't stay there. So is there any hope? Is there any hope for me? I'm off Riddick and stuff falling apart. I'm never going to get there. Ecclesiastes 1, 16 through 18, Solomon dealt with this. He said, he said, I said to myself, look, I have increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ever ruled over Jerusalem before me. I've experienced much wisdom and much knowledge. Then I applied myself to understanding of wisdom and also to madness and folly, but I learned this too as chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow, the more knowledge and the more grief. Whew. Solomon said, you know, I'm like a dog chasing his tail. I was never going to catch it. How do you catch it? How do you get to that pinnacle that Marslo, Maslo, Maslow was talking about? How do you get to the place where you wake up in the morning and go, yes, I am so excited to be right where I am. You see, the truth is that the purpose of the laws of nature and God are to point you to the place where you and I need God. Need God. Galatians chapter 3, verse 23, before the, coming, before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked under the faith that was to come to be revealed, so that the law was a guardian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. Justified by faith. What does justified mean? Justified means that we can stand before God without judgment, without conviction, without penalty. John chapter 17, verse 3, now this is eternal life that you, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. 2 Corinthians 5, 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them. That God was reconciling the world to himself. They think about that. God was fixing it so that you and I could have a relationship with him. That, that in spite of what we've done, not counting our sins against us, he has committed, 
He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. To them, God has chosen to make known the wondrous, glorious riches of the mystery of Christ in Colossians 1.27, which is what? Christ in you, the hope of glory. How do we get there? You ready? You know what, God, as far as life goes, I've blown it. I have just, I, I just blown it. Do you ever, ever wake up and go, wow, I blew it? You ever look at your wife or your husband and say, I'm sorry, I blew it? I, my, my son barred, barred the car last night and he, yesterday afternoon. He called me on the way home and said, Dad, I'm sorry, I got a problem. I said, son, what's wrong? He said, well, I, I ran over a nail and the tire went flat. And I said, well, well you know, I, I made sure that mom had a spare. There's a spare in there. He said, yeah, yeah, dad, but you know, the, the, we were on the kind of a rough road and I didn't notice that it had gone flat for a little bit. And so, I, you know, the tire can't be fixed. I said, well, son, you can pull the nail out. I mean, I've got stuff I can plug. He said, well, dad, the side of the tire's falling out. And I'm going... <clears throat> He said, uh, you know, Dad, I lost my week, job a couple weeks ago. And I said, yeah, son, I understand. Uh, is everybody okay? He, he said, yeah. He said, Dad, it's going to take all the money I've got to put a tire on it. But, and, and discount tire is closed tomorrow. I'll bring it back on Monday and I'll put a tire on it. I said, son, that's okay. Just, I'm glad you are okay. Just bring the car home and, uh, you know, I'll take care of the tire. How many of you are moms or dads? What you do, right? You, of course, you, you look at them and, and you slap them upside the head and say, I can't believe you ran over a nail in the road. Didn't you see that nail as you're going down the highway going 70 miles an hour? Couldn't you have done any better than that? I can't believe you sorry thing. You ran that, you know, you, 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 right. You do that, right? Who in, the, who in their right mind would do that? You know what it is? It's just the tire. But you know what? That's my son. That's my daughter-in-law. But even more important than that, that's my grandson. The tire's nothing. I'll, I'll pay to put a tire on the car. But you see, the problem is that when I became disobedient with God, no matter what I do, I can't pay to fix my sin. You can't go back and undo it. Every one of us that have done something just that we look at and go, why did I do that? I've had numerous friends that are, are in recovery. And I asked, I asked a friend of mine several years back, I said, listen, how did, how did you... How did you get over the problem with the mirror? He said, well, what problem are you talking about? I said, do you realize, I don't know if you're like me, but, but I, I ran from God and did some stupid things. And when I look at myself in the mirror, I, I don't see me. I see me doing those stupid things. And the regret pops up and the worry pops up and, and how am I ever going to move beyond this? He said, man, Carl, is every day until I realized that that's over, done with, and gone. You see, the truth about it is, is, that, is, is that when Paul said that Christ, God was working in Christ to reconcile the world to him, that we would be justified, means that everything that you and I have ever done wrong, God placed on Jesus on the cross. He laid that on Jesus. So when Satan comes to me and says, Dino, do you remember when you did this? I go, Jesus took care of that. Do you remember when Jesus took care of that? 
Even things that I've accidentally felt, Jesus took care of that. And it has so freed me. I don't have to do like Maslow said and work hard every day to do something exciting, to enjoy life. Life is a joy because I know that I am a child of God. You see, the truth about it is, is that all the universe, everything is created, points us to the place where we realize we need a Savior. We need him. The question is, how far does the world have to push us before we say yes? I choose Jesus. See, the truth is, from the very beginning of time, God knew that you and I were going to rebel. And from the very beginning of time, God said, Son, at one point in time, I'm going to have to send you to the world to be born as a child, to live a sinless life. And son, I'm going to have to crucify you on the cross to pay the penalty for their sins. And when you do, I'm going to send you into hell for three days. And after three days, son, I want you to whoop them. And I want you to whoop Satan. And I want you to rise from the dead and holding in your hands the keys to life and death and hell so that for all eternity I can offer that very thing to every single person that walks the face of the earth. Because every single one of us needs a Savior. Jesus says, for those of you that need a Savior, I am your guy. Please stand, let's pray together. Father God, thank you for your love and your grace. <coughs> Father, thank you for loving us so much you sent your Son. God, thank you that no matter what we've done, no matter what we do, it's been covered by the blood of Jesus on the cross. And that you've come that we might have life and have it more abundantly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs>